Um, so I, I will, so, okay, so I think this is where we are and I apologize, um, you know, the font size is very small, but anyway, you have my slides, so hopefully that should be okay. So as we were talking about yesterday, um, uh, the reaction we are interested in is some inclusive deep elastic. So we have an incident lepton coming with uh, three momentum K scatter uh, uh, lepton momentum K prime and virtual photon is being exchanged. Okay, and then um, here's the target. And um, so in the, in the summer inclusive DIS measurement, in addition to detecting the scatter lepton, um, we also will detect the leading hadron. And so the virtual photon vector, which is, I hope you can see, there is a yellow um, arrow here and the hadron on momentum. So that defined the hadron plane, which is the yellow plane. And the, um, the incident and scatter lepton momentum define, uh, define the uh, lepton plane, which is the uh, gray uh, plane. And we have another vector, which is the target polarization. Okay, so here uh, we use a green arrow to show it is the target uh, polarization. Um, so in this case, for some inclusive DIS measurement, there are two um, azimuthal angles uh, which are important. One is so-called phi edge, and this is the azimuthal angle of the um, Pajon plane relative to the um, lepton plane. Okay, and the other is the uh, phi S. S uh, stands for the spin of the target. And it is basically um, this um, um, spin vector. And you, you can think about this as the, uh, um, you know, the plane is defined by the spin and also virtual photon relative to uh, the lepton plane. And that angle is phi, uh, phi S. Okay, so, um, and there are a bunch of kinematic quantities, um, but they are, you know, all, define the uh, momentum K, K prime and uh, uh, hadron momentum and also the three momentum vector for virtual photon is Q. And we talk about um, the four momentum uh, uh, square before. And, and, the pro, and, and the nuclear mass, we use uh, M, capital M is the nuclear mass proton here. And I see everything else is just, um, you know, just kinematic uh, uh, variables. And um, so one important quantity is, um, what, what do I have here? Yeah, so this is, you can look at this as the invariant mass. Um, uh, P is the um, four momentum of the uh, um, target plus the uh, um, four momentum of the virtual photon. So that gives you the invariant uh, mass uh, um, W um, of the system. Okay. So this is something I'm not going to go over in great detail, but you know, you, you actually can always go back to uh, uh, refer to this. As I uh, already introduced that um, the Bjorgen X is defined as Q square over two and mu, mu is the energy transfer. Okay, so um, here is um, a little bit complicated. Um, um, this is the, uh, um, the differential cross section for some inclusive uh, DIS measurement. And um, what we have here is basically we you know, assumed uh, the factorization holds and we write down everything in terms of different combinations of beam and target uh, polarization. So when I say polarization, unpolarized is of course, you know, uh, is also included here. So the, the, the experiment is just think about, um, we have an electron, for example, can be muon, right? So it's an electron on a proton target and the proton can be polarized, electron can be polarized. And, um, and in terms of polarization uh, for the uh, um, target, you know, can be longitudinally polarized or transversely uh, polarized. And so what do we have? So we have, um, Phi S, Phi H, I already talked about, and we also talk about the hadron uh, momentum, and this is just transverse uh, to the uh, virtual photon momentum direction. And X is beyond X, and the Y and Z uh, are defined here, and Z is uh, essentially just the energy carried by the detected hadron relative to the virtual photon energy or the energy transfer from the lepton beam. 
okay, and why is defined here is the fraction of the electron energy transfer in the nuclear uh, thrust frame. Okay, so this is, as you can imagine, it is actually quite complicated. And um, so we can write this down in terms of unpolarized pieces and, and polarized, uh, single uh, spin polarized. So in the case of single spin polarized, you can have a polarized uh, target, or you can, oh, where is, yeah, so here is, um, let me let me make sure I'm not making any mistakes. So okay, so U U here re refers to both the beam and target are not polarized, and so here I have um right okay so I have a uh, beam is longitudinally wait sorry um target is longitudinally polarized so beam is unpolarized okay and then so this uh, the first one the label is for the beam and the second subscript is for the target. So this is target is longitudinally polarized and beam is unpolarized. And then I can also have a transversely polarized target here and beam is unpolarized. And then I can have a target, sorry, beam is polarized and target is also polarized. This is so-called double uh, polarized uh, um, uh, uh, polarization measurement. And then I can also have, uh, we use the, the lambda E to represent is the electron uh, uh, helicity, either plus one or minus one uh, uh, polarization. And um, so we have uh, both uh, electron is longitudinal polarized and target is also, or you have a, a transversely polarized target and longitudinally polarized uh, uh, electron beam or, or lepton beam. So what is really nice is in this framework, okay, if this framework works and in principle, what we can do a complete measurement. You can do unpolarized measurement, and you can do single spin, um, uh, single uh, spin, uh, uh, single spin asymmetry measurement, and then you can also do that double uh, spin asymmetry. And then different um, uh, terms here will uh, give us um, information about the corresponding uh, uh, TMDs we uh, talked about um, previously um, yeah, last night. And um, so here, just uh, show you uh, how they are related. Um, you, you can actually, uh, when you do this kind of experiment completely in the end, you are able to um, um, identify um, the pieces um, or the specific uh, TMD. Uh, but it's actually the experiment is complicated. And of course, you have to uh, believe, you know, of this form formulism uh, is correct. And you want to make sure, you know, this actually uh, works. This is uh, at the leading uh, leading order, okay. And um, so, what I wanted to do now is just to focus on um, uh, uh, the situation of the cases when the target is transversely polarized and the beam is unpolarized. So this is also called single target spin asymmetry measurement, okay. So so we can um, so in this case, what the kind of experiment we do is that I, I polarize the target, right? And I can flip the target uh, spin uh, uh, direction. So up and down, up and down, right? And then I measure uh, some inclusive DIS events in my detector with respect to the spin uh, orientation up versus down and um, normalized by the sum. And you have to, you know, um, uh, uh, correct for the polarization. If the polarization is 100% one, of course, that's just the ratio of your uh, normalized uh, events or normalized yield over the sum. Okay, so this is called single spin um, asymmetry. And in this case, what is uh, interesting or, or, or very nice is that um, you have three different, based on the formulas that we have here, um, you have a target polarized, and then we have this term, and then we have, this is um, phi h plus phi s, and then we have phi h minus phi s, and then we also have a three phi h minus phi s. And by the way, this paper um, um, give you very, very detailed um, in, uh, derivation and uh, all the formulas if you want to uh, know, uh, it's all in this paper. And so, so, so then uh, you, you, what, what you wanted to do experimentally is you want to be able to disentangle 
uh, this kind of different uh, azimuthal angular dependence with respect to these two azimuthal angles. And the coefficient of the amplitude uh, in front, uh, we call um, for this uh, azimuthal dependence, we call uh, Collins uh, 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 um, asymmetry. And then this one is Sievers, and this is crystallosity. And, and basically, the, uh, um, the, uh, the, you can think about as the amplitude um, uh, modulation for the azimuthal dependence, and that is actually um, is um, determined or related to the convolution of, in this case, the Collins um, TMD and the Collins fragmentation function. Okay, and then in the Sievers case, um, that corresponding to just the unpolarized uh, fragmentation function and the Sievers uh, 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 distribution TMD, and then. In the crystallosity case, that's the crystallosity um, uh, TMD and um, 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 Collins fragmentation function. And we, I, I just briefly mentioned yesterday that uh, one can get the Collins uh, fragmentation function information from E plus E minus collision goes to charge prime pair. And what actually people have been doing is really to analyze uh, both CDIS and the E plus E minus together to carry out a global. Um, um, analysis and to determine um, um, these uh, functions, I mean, these quantities, okay? And um, so actually these single spin asymmetry um, in terms of kinematics, uh, they actually depend on PT is the hadron transverse momentum and Z, we talk about that briefly and for momentum transfer uh, square Q and also X. So it's actually very, very complicated in the sense that if you want to get the TMD information and you measure single spin asymmetry and you disentangle these angular dependence, uh, one thing is obvious is, first of all, you need to have a good azimuthal angular coverage. And then you also need to have a good azimuthal angular resolution. And then you also need to have um, you know, very uh, 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 good um, uh, kinematic coverage. And because um, the asymmetry depends on all four quantities, so ideally you want to map um, the single spin asymmetry in this kind of phase space. And then in the end, you can um, uh, you want to uh, determine um, this kind of uh, measurement uh, precisely so you can get the TMD uh, information. And um, so very, very quickly, just to uh, one slide um, here, just to tell you, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, Hermes and um, Compass experiment. Hermes is an experiment at Daisy, and um, Compass is an uh, experiment at CERN. These are the two experiments uh, which are uh, pioneered uh, in terms of using uh, transversely polarized uh, nuclear target and to do single spin asymmetry measurement to provide information or to observe uh, Collins asymmetry and Sievers asymmetry and crystallosity. Uh, asymmetry. So Hermes, um, we mentioned, uh, we talked to you yesterday, and this is at Hera, and Hermes um, get both polarized, I mean, Hera can provide polarized, oh, oh, sorry, in this case, you know, you don't really need the beam to be polarized, but it actually, um, um, Hermes also did a lot of um, double spin asymmetry measurement to determine the the, the quark and uh, the quark uh, helicity contribution to the nuclear spin, which we introduced yesterday um, in uh, inclusive DIS measurement. So um, the beam can be um, you know, uh, positron or electron. And um, so this show you the, um, the Hermes um, uh, experimental setup, and we talk about the internal target from Hermes. And um, so the beam is 27.5 and polarized, uh, well, as I said, in this case, you don't really need the, uh, the beam polarization, but, and the target is, um, uh, Hermes started with um, helium-3 based on, I have to say, um, yeah, the helium-3 target from Hermes, um, uh, Hermes program started with polarized helium-3 uh, uh, measurement. Um, and, and I believe, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure the target was based on metastability exchange optical pumping, which I also mentioned briefly. And the target was installed, um, I think it was 94 to 95, because um,
Yeah, it, it was, it, sorry, <laughs> it was 94-95 because I was, uh, I just started as a postdoc at UINC and I actually worked on the target, um, the, 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 the main group or uh, the leader of the target was Richard Miller's group at IIT, but I, um, I work on Polar's Team in Three Target. We collaborated at MIT Bates um, on this kind of target. So I'm trying to remember why I actually was involved. But anyway, so I was uh, working on that uh, target at Hermes. And, and later, as I mentioned, the program all used uh, atomic beam source uh, for polarized hydrogen and deuterium. And the TND physics or some inclusive DIS measurement will ha uh, happen later. So they all use atomic beam source uh, target. Okay. And Hermes experiment uh, finished data taking in 2007. Okay, so um, yeah, um, so right, it says new results. So apparently Hermes, um, even though the data taking completed in 2007, but this actually are the slides or the results showed um, by Gunnar uh, Schneer um, last May uh, at Jefferson Lab. Um, we actually organized uh, a workshop from it says TND from JLab to EIC. So Hermes of uh, uh, Gunnar showed on um, these results. So what do we what are we looking at? Okay, so we are looking at uh, Sievers uh, amplitude and for um, both. So here is the yeah 2020 result for pi plus and pi minus, and here also multiplicity result uh, for both pi plus pi minus, but also for neutral uh, pi zero. And so what are we looking at? Okay, so um, the so you see, um, so here is this this panel here um, shows as, as a function of x, and the middle panel panels here are as a function of z. Um, and then this is the uh, um, as a function of the transverse or momentum of the uh, um, hadron. So pi plus and pi minus. So one thing you notice uh, perhaps is that um, you, you see that the, uh, the asymmetry of the amplitude, um, of course the amplitude determines columns, oh sorry, Sievers asymmetry. So you see that um, in the pi plus case, and um, you have a larger, or we see a larger uh, Sievers uh, amplitude compared with uh, pi uh, minus. Okay, so that's one thing you can conclude. But the other thing quite interesting is that, um, you know, if you look at the Z dependence, um, and it looks like um, there is some interesting uh, Z dependence or turnover with respect to Z. And, and you actually, so in the pi plus case, looks like the amplitude as a function of Z goes up and then come down, although at, in high Z, um, area, the experimental uncertainties are, are larger, but nevertheless, I think the trend is actually quite convincing, okay? And, and here you see a little bit, um, but because of the overall uncertainty and also because the overall amplitude for the sievers for pi minus is small, so it's a little bit difficult to see whether it, this looks like flat or may even go down, uh, it's hard to tell. But certainly um, there is something quite interesting. And uh, you also see uh, as a function of transverse moment of the hadron in the pi plus case, you see something um, you know, quite interesting um, and in the pi minus is relatively flat. And, and, and Hermes also showed um, the Sievers amplitude for pi zero and neutral pi um, measurement is uh, much difficult than charge pi. So usually people measure uh, pi zero decay to two photons. So you need to measure um, the, the two photons. You have to have a good calorimeter to measure that. Um, but, but looking at this um, um, results, it's a little bit um, difficult to really say too much um, because of the uh, overall the uncertainties, um, you know, large, right, the experimental uncertainty large, but perhaps, perhaps you can conclude, I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but perhaps we can conclude that looks like there is um, perhaps non-zero um, zeros uh, amplitude in the pi zero case as well. Okay, but, but um, right, so in the pi zero case, um, you know, 
you, you do worry. Uh, I, I, I think that not just in Pi Zero case, in other case, you do worry about the background, how low decay, low zero decay. Okay, um, so, and let's continue. And what is very interesting is that in addition to zeros um, in four pions, Hermes also showed uh, anti-proton uh, results. And I find this actually quite interesting. So, and, and, and of course they look at the proton as well, okay? So, um, you know, the, the leading hadron can be a baryon, right? So in this case, they look at, um, uh, they compare pi plus um, uh, with uh, proton. So both are uh, positive charged particle, but one is uh, um, meson, the other is baryon. Um, so interestingly, um, within experimental uncertainty, it looks like um, the X dependence very similar, right? And, and here for the Z dependence, it is a little bit difficult to, to say um, because the uh, error bar, but um, probably I cannot say they look very different, but I cannot say they look very similar either. And um, in the P perp on uh, transverse, momentum distribution uh, uh, dependence on the uh, transverse um, moment of the hadron. And even within the error bar, they look actually quite similar. So it's actually quite interesting. Okay, so maybe we can conclude that um, within the experimental uncertainty, when we look at pi plus and the proton, they seem to look you know, uh, quite uh, similar, okay? But then you look at um, anti-proton, comparison, um, okay, so that's difficult to compare because it uh, looks like it's, uh, um, the, the uncertainty is large um, in the X and Z dependence, um, they seem to be not inconsistent, but here um, it's hard to say anything because the scatter of the data, but nothing is inconsistent with the uh, error bar either. Okay, um, so, so this is Hermes. And then um, another very important aspect, um, as I mentioned, is that, um, let's see, what, do we, what are we looking at here? Yeah, okay, so this is what, what um, I think this is the plot. Um, um, interesting. Um, so remember I mentioned earlier that the single spin asymmetry or Collins uh, asymmetry or amplitude, sievers, crystallosity, they have four dimensional um, kinematic quantity. Uh, they have dependence on four kinematic quantity, right? X, Z, and um, Q square, and the P, H per, right? Hadron um, transverse momentum. So this picture here, this um, um, figure here actually shows you um, the uh, Collins uh, amplitude, so it's phi, phi h plus phi s, okay? Sometimes people just write phi plus phi s. So it is Collins amplitude uh, in three dimensions. So how do we see that? So um, the horizontal axis here is z, so that's uh, as a function of z, okay? So everyone is from 0.25 to 0.75, okay? So that's the z dependence. And then, um, so, so now you look at um, every, if you think about this as a table, so this column here, uh, we are looking at a particular uh, pH per beam. So there's a um, transverse momentum of the hadron. Okay, so here I look as a function of hadron transverse momentum. Okay, so in this case, it is, I think it's pi on. Um, and yeah, it is, it is pi minus. So this is um, higher, a little bit higher pH per and a little bit higher. And uh, um, in the end, the last thing is actually from 0.554 to 2 GB. Okay, so what else? Um, and um, so there's also, so we talk about the, this um, column and then what about the row, right? So here we also show you the, uh, essentially it's the X dependence. So this is the smallest X Okay, so X is from 0.023 to 0.072, and then the largest X being is from 0.138 to 0.6. Okay, so this actually gave you, um, and I forgot um, what is the Q square. So the, sorry, I apologize for that, but um, the Q square here must be a fixed uh, Q square, or I'm sorry, should not be fixed. They integrate over all the Q-square coverage of the uh, Hermes uh, sections. 
Otherwise, I'm showing you a uh, 4D dependence or uh, 4D map. So here is a three-dimensional map. Um, so it, it, it actually tells you Hermes already is able um, you know, with the, this kind of internal um, gas jet target in a storage ring, and they are able to they are able to um, look at um, um, Collins and Sievers amplitude, which I will show next, um, later in three dimensions. Okay, um, compass. Um, compass is another experiment uh, with a, a electron beam, and in this case, it's muon beam. And the muon beam um, is actually produced a little bit more in, involved. So uh, you have a proton beam on the uh, nuclear target, essentially, right? Some kind of um, nuclear target and produce uh, pions, and then pion decay, and you have a muon beam. And um, so, so this is the uh, compass uh, uh, schematics of the experiment, and they actually, um, you know, can be look at this in terms of two uh, angular range, and they call uh, SM1, SM2, so spectrometer one, uh, which is uh, considered a larger angle, so which is closer to the target. Okay, and um, so SM2 is the more forward angle, they call small angle um, SM2. And um, we talked about this yesterday. Um, compass use uh, nuclear uh, dynamic uh, uh, pol uh, nuclear polarization technique and to polarize their target. And then they use an ammonia three. Remember, we need to introduce some kind of impurity, right? So they use ammonia three, ammonia here, NH three for polarized proton. So um, in the experiment, you have to worry about so-called unpolarized nuclei, which are from um, 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 nitrogen. So that is your dilution factor, but that's an experimental detail. You do need to worry about that. You need to, um, which contribute, with, your asymmetry will be diluted by the unpolarized uh, nuclei, right? Um, okay, so, so then for the deuteron, they use uh, this uh, six uh, deuteron. And um, so that's the corresponding um, polarization value and also dilution factor, which takes care of basically tell you, you know, the kind of contamination or dilution of your polarization, uh, polarization dependent quantity diluted because you have an unpolarized um, uh, particles. Okay, and uh, what else I want to say, um, maybe not too much, and other than, you know, this is the uh, Oh, yeah, here just show you, they, they show there, uh, remember for CDS measurement, um, you look at the hadron coming out, they look at pions, pion, they also have a proton. So that show you the kind of how well we can separate uh, the target uh, as a function of uh, target uh, momentum and also the angle where, the, where you see the, uh, the, the particle and which they use a uh, rich detector for PID, okay, and um, okay. So, so this is the uh, compass uh, results. Um, this is Collins uh, asymmetry for the proton. And um, two different colors. Uh, one is the um, charge, um, positive charge hadron, and the other is a negative uh, charge uh, hadron here. And um, so, so in, the, um, in the compass data, um, you see the Collins asymmetry um, um, between a uh, negative and positive hadrons uh, looks like there is, uh, you know, one is positive, the other is negative. Okay, and you see that um, basically in, in X, you see that in Z, and you see that in pH, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, transverse, as a function of uh, hadron trans transverse momentum. And by the way, when you see this kind of uh, plot and as a function of X or Z, that already um, implies that the other kinematic quantity you integrate over. Uh, so in order to have a good uh, statistics. Okay, and then what is interesting is that in the case of uh, Dupont, and essentially within experimental uncertainty, they see that uh, compared with proton and the symmetry seem to be consistent with zero. So you always have the question, uh, whether you know that is because of the some kind of conservation between uh, the 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 DIS I mean CDS uh, production from the uh, polarized proton and the polarized neutron, 
Uh, remember, we talk about one can use the neutron to study um, the, the neutron um, uh, structure to get the neutron structure information, but you really need to understand the proton very well uh, in order to uh, uh, extract the neutron information. And, and for this reason, that is why it is important to do polarized helium 3 where the proton effect of the, the, the effect due to polarized proton in helium 3 is highly su suppressed. Um, in the case of polarized helium 3 um, as I mentioned, um, neutron is about 88% polarized. And if you wonder you know, how much a proton is polarized inside the helium 3 or how big is the proton polarization, it is actually about minus 2.7%. So if helium 3 is polarized up, and you have a proton polarized down. Uh, and with, if this is 100% polarized, you have minus, less than minus 3% um, polarized, uh, polarization for the proton in the opposite direction. OK, so um, and then what, what do we have here? OK, so here I think that um, Compass also um, has been working on looking at, um, remember, there is this four-dimensional dependence with respect to these four-dimensional kinematic quantities. So all the experiments um, are looking, of course, you know, if you have sufficient statistics, then you can look at your data, right, in uh, great detail. For example, here show you, um, you look at the data, right, uh, you beam the data uh, looking at as a function of Q square, but also as a function of X, right? So this is the kind of grid. For example, this particular grid will corresponding to, you know, Q is from Q squared from three to seven, and then X is from, sorry, um, X is, this is log scale, right? But you understand it is 0 0.02 or a few times 0 0.02 to, yeah. So, so this is the way you wanted to look. And here is, you can look at this data in also in, the two-dimensional uh, PT, which is the, uh, we, sometimes we also call PH per and the Z, right? So in a different two dimension, we try to divide uh, the data. And ideally you want to look at four dimensional space. If you can imagine you have four dimensional space and you want to you know, make all the kind of four dimensional grids. Okay, so here just show you an example from Compass. Um, this is the proton data to see how this look like on um, horizontal axis is Z. And what do we have? So this is um, X is larger than 0 0.03. And then the uh, momentum is uh, in uh, the, the P, the P um, per PT is um, 0.1 to 0.2 GV over C. And then you, from left to right, um, PT goes up. Okay, and um, I mean, it, it is clear once, when you wanted to slice the data uh, more finely, and the error bars are much uh, bigger compared with if you integrate over. But then, of course, when you look at the data in this kind of detail, you also it is also more informative. So it's it's a balance, right? So ideally, you want to um, have uh, you know have a ideal detector has a two pi as a of angular dependence can have a highly polarized uh, proton and the neutron, uh, neutron is in quote, and also high luminosity, right? So that you can really do this kind of mapping of four dimensional um, asymmetry. And, and this is the, um, what do we have here? Um, this is um, the, uh, again, uh, yeah. So here shows the charge prime result from proton, from compass as a function of X and Z and the PT, and then also K on. Okay, so um, so k plus k minus. So the pion results are more precise than the kion, but the kion can tell us information about strange and um, anti-strange quark um, uh, uh, distribution um, inside the, the nucleon. Okay, so um, here I just want to put, um, so what do we have here? So here we have, um, yeah, so this is Sievers um, from Hermes and Sievers from Compass in terms of the three-dimensional um, mapping or three-dimensional distribution um, we talk about. 
So um, this is just plot a little bit differently. And uh, again, this is X. And now um, the vertical uh, axis um, is Z. The vertical axis is Z. And from low Z to high Z, and then um, pi, we, are, we are showing pi plus, and then the uh, transverse moment of the hadron from left to right is from low uh, P uh, T um, to higher uh, transverse moment of the hadron. And then here I show you um, the uh, um, similarly, but not plotting exactly the same way, but the idea is here also is a three-dimensional, I mean, 3D mapping of the sievers um, um, asymmetry. Um, so for Hermes, uh, what's shown is the sievers uh, amplitude. Okay, so these are the, um, as I mentioned, Hermes uh, completed data taking into 07 and Compass um, uh, continues. And um, Compass, um, it's already 22. So I, I need to find out what is the latest because they also have some impact due to COVID. And, and also um, Compass had a, um, in addition to the, the CDIS uh, program, they also have um, a, a, a new experiment approved, uh, which is called Ember, and they are uh, doing uh, muon uh, proton uh, elastic scattering at you know, very high energy. And it's actually quite uh, remarkable to think about this because at Jefferson Lab, um, we did um, elastic electron proton elastic scattering at, you know, 1 GeV, 1.1 GeV, 2.2 GeV in order to determine the proton charge radius. At Compass, they use you know, over 100 GeV muon B to do muon on proton elastic scaling. Also wanted to determine the proton charge radius using uh, mu plus uh, mu minus B. Okay, so because of that, it's not clear exactly whether they are taking data on the CDIS uh, on the Duhan or not. Remember, um, early I show you that um, the original, the very early um, compass result, um, um, Sievers and the um, Collins asymmetry from the Duhan, and shows the asymmetry uh, seem to be consistent with zero with experimental uncertainty. And then because you have a Duhan, so it's a proton plus neutron. So it's not clear whether it's, it's a cancellation or it is because you have not really achieved the kind of accuracy you would like to have. And so Compass has a, um, you know, have a plan and they have approved experiment to take data on, on, the, deuteron, um, on the deuteron target. And, and here just show, um, show you, um, right. So, so um, here, here just some, um, you know, um, basically motivation in terms of compass, uh, the energy is higher. So uh, it's complementary to uh, what Jefferson Lab can do at 12 GE, as well as, I mean, it has overlap uh, with EIC, but also complementary. So here show you uh, the kind of improvement, right? So, so what is the purpose? So the purpose is we do experiment on proton, right? And then we do experiment on um, a neutron in this case is a neutron target. And um, if, you know, if you, maybe you can take on the prediction from lattice um, for what we should expect on the strange park um, TND, or you just, for now, let's just say, okay, let's just assume strange park effect is, you know, negligible, for example, then you can actually do a flavor separation to look at um, sievers due to U-quark and D-quark. So here it basically show you uh, with proton and deuteron measurement and how you can uh, determine the, uh, the sievers uh, for u quark and d quark. And the gray is a little bit difficult or perhaps difficult for you to see. Um, there is a gray here also, and then there uh, is the red uh, hashed uh, region. And, and here is the d quark, uh, which the gray area is what currently uh, from the uh, analysis uh, um, you can get. Uh, global analysis, and once you include the upcoming um, uh, compass uh, DuPont results. And by the way, I think, sorry, the analysis is just for the compass uh, data. And, and once you also have the uh, uh, measurement from the compass uh, upcoming measurement uh, from the DuPont, you can see, which is, um, which is, I think is intuitive, is that um, 
the, the DPOC um, series will be significantly improved, right? Because um, you need a neutron beta, right? So in the case of neutron, naively you think about that as a U quark and 2D quark. And because we are only talking about adding additional neutron measurement, it will improve the U quark determination a little bit, but not too much, right? Because you know the neutron uh, result, uh, the proton measurement, let's just put it that way. Remember I showed early their proton polarization is like 70, 80% and the neutron is, um, I think it's 50 or 60%. So that, um, which means that you, you, you know, your proton measurement is just more precise. Sorry, here it is. Yeah, you see, in the case of proton, you have 90% polarization and dilution that is small, right? So you weigh in polarization and you also have a less dilution or contamination from unpolarized particles, nucleons. But in the case of deuteron, you, you have a lower pol polarization and also you have a larger uh, dilution factor. So. So that's why I show you, even though I take additional measurement from deuteron, which also should contribute to the flavor separation and improve um, the U quark, but it's not too much um, just because the proton measurement is um, very good. And okay, so this is what uh, was the impact on the, uh, um, oh, I have not talked about the tensor charge. Um, yeah, I mentioned this yesterday, but I have later slides in which I will, I'll say a few more words about tensor charge, but for now, just take my words for it. It's an important quantity, and this is a quantity uh, you need to determine transversity distribution, and then you need to transversity TND. Then you know you integrate over on um, you know k k k k k per, which is the quark transverse momentum, and then you get the uh, um, transversity, which is just depend on the uh, XBL gain. And then you integrate over x gain if you measure, you know, all, obviously you never measure from zero to one, the entire region. And then you have a good way, reliable way you can extrapolate. And then you can calculate uh, the integral and the integral is give us the tensor charge. Okay, so for now, just um, um, let me show you um, the kind of uh, improvement for the uh, tensor charge. Okay, again, um, when you when you do um, yeah here we show you sievers but of course composite experiment do you know they will disentangle the angular distribution so they you know they will measure columns and here just show you columns and um, so they here shows the current um, um, information they get so they actually give you. Um, in the measured x region, okay. So you can think about that as the integral. But you know, if you want to get the tensor charge, you also need to do extrapolation. So for now, they present uh, what you will get in the uh, compass kinematic region, and this is the current one. And you can see the project one is a little bit better, but not um, well. It's about um, improvement by about a third. But then you look at the do uh, you look at the uh, um, the the d quark. And you can see the improvement is you know more than a factor of two, right, two and a half, or more than a factor two and a half, um, compared with um, what we currently uh, uh, have from Compass. And when you include the new data, and then this quantity is uh, called, um, uh, which is the uh, um, this is the ISO vector, which is just look at the difference, and then you can compare. And by the way, all these quantities uh, when you integrate over from zero to one. And we now have very uh, good uh, prediction or uh, reliable prediction from the lattice. So the improvement in the tensor charge um, or in this particular um, isovector um, tensor charge um, improvement is about a factor two compared with what we currently know. Okay, so um, I talked to you about um, Compress, uh, Hermes and Compress, and then the third experiment is Jefferson Lab. And so in, in, uh, in, in Jefferson lab experiment, um, we didn't do a uh, proton and we did the neutron and we used polarized helium-3. And this experiment was uh, conducted in um, Hall A at Jefferson lab um, in 2010. Wait, when did we do the experiment? Um, let me think for one second. Um, so 
now is 2022 and okay so we did experiment we must have done experiment in 2007 around 2007 ish um because the, i i don't know why i said 2010 but the student who actually uh, the students uh, uh, my student uh, xin Tian, he actually graduated um, 2010 so the experiment i think we took data 2007 and then maybe part of 2008 so that was around the time Hermes was um, about to complete um, its data taking. And, and I want to say that um, in hall A, um, I don't have a picture. I should have an overall picture to show Jella, but it's okay. So in hall A um, at that time, and which is still the case, there are two spectrometer called high resolution spectrometer. So these spectrometer, um, have very high uh, momentum and angular resolution, but they have a small acceptance. And there are two, um, um, <laughs> by design, there should be two identical ones, one to the beam left, one to the beam right, but one of the spectrometer, um, when it, after it was built, um, or in the process of being built, there was something didn't go very well. So there is a little bit difference in terms of one of the magnet. Um, but other than that, you know, they are almost the same. But in this particular experiment, we actually didn't use um, the other standard uh, high resolution spectrometer, which is HRS right. We, we just move it out of the way. And then we use a big byte, uh, which is a kind of open geometry uh, uh, dipole magnets, and then you put uh, a series of detectors. And um, so in order to uh, use that to give us a uh, uh, relatively speaking large acceptance. And I think that high resolution spectrometer in hall A, the solid angle is less than six or radian, if I remember correctly. And big byte is you know, more than a hundred. So that gives us uh, a little bit uh, a larger acceptance, but still far away from being uh, ideal. For this kind of experiment, remember, uh, I show you the differential cross section, which is uh, has so many dimensions, right? You really ideally you want to be able to catch everything. So you and, and then also um, you want to have a azimuthal angular acceptance or, or full azimuthal angular acceptance, and we, we just don't have that. So in our measurement, when we look at the uh, phi edge, for example, and we see a lot of holes in our acceptance. Nevertheless, uh, we actually uh, accomplished um, this was the first this kind of experiment and um, at Jefferson Lab and definitely the first one ever using polarized helium 3 for this physics. And we ran the experiment at 5.9 GV. Um, so this experiment was near the end of the 6 GV era. So 5.9 GV was the highest at the time. Now, of course, um, after the 12 GV upgrade, um, you know, the energy is getting very close to 12 GV now. Okay. And, and the, the, the Q square is similar as Hermes. And um, we say it's the first neutron data. That's interesting. So maybe we, we actually, um, I, I, uh, I should go back to um, take a look, but um, maybe we publish this data perhaps even before compass uh, 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 neutron results. Otherwise we wouldn't say first. And uh, we disentangled columns and sievers, and the luminosity is um, relatively high. It's 10 to the 36. And um, so we use this high pressure polarized helium 3 target. And this target is able to take a uh, beam current on uh, 12 to 15 micron. But now I will show you later, now this target, uh, the improved version of this target after um, you know, more than a decade, um, can take much higher current. Okay, so, so this is the uh, experimental setup. And um, I guess this is not so interesting other than uh, what is interesting is the, uh, we achieved uh, in B, we achieved target polarization 65%, which is actually considered at that time, it was the record. Okay, and um, so, Expand, you know, the, the target looks the following. It's actually quite simple. It's a, it's a glass cell, uh, has a two chamber. They are all connected. So it's all one piece. And but making the cell is highly non-trivial. Um, and the cell is actually um, a room temperature. Typically, it's a 10 atmosphere um, pressure. 
and that is a high uh, pressure uh, system. So you need to be very, very careful working with this kind of target and the beam coming from this way. And then the rest is uh, um, um, providing magnetic holding field, but also um, and also part of the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance uh, for target polarization measurement. And um, I think this is not the best picture to show, but in this experiment, actually we have three sets of chemicals coil, okay? So which means that we actually can polarize on the target in any direction you want in three dimensional space. And here just show you one set, but in fact, we have, um, if you think about this as Z, we have also, you know, um, along the uh, X, um, uh, Y as an axis and also the other way X. So we can, uh, we, we have a magnetic uh, holding field. We can apply any kind of holding field in any direction. Um, I should correct what I just said, but typically the maximum field uh, strength we are running is you know, less than 30 gauss. So it's a relatively weak um, uh, field. Okay, so um, yeah, the only thing I wanted to show you is um, the experiment is called E06010, and that was the experiment I just uh, mentioned here. Okay, which was the first one on it on, on CDIS and TMB physics uh, at JLA. And if you look at polarized helium 3 um, based on spin exchange optical pumping technique used um, in the original, very early on, early 1990s, um, this is a slab experiment, try to contribute to resolve the proton spin puzzle or proton spin crisis in the early 1990s. So you see figure of merit. So what is figure merit? Essentially, it's a polarization square times uh, whatever beam current, uh, electron beam current you can take. Okay, so that determines the statistics um, of the measured asymmetry given, um, you know, uh, the given the time, uh, running time. And, and you can see this is E142, and then, um, um, and we did, um, yeah, so, so this is one of the first uh, Jefferson lab on um, uh, DIS, inclusive DIS experiment, you can see already improved a lot compared with the slack experiment. And, and both in terms of polarization and also overall figure merit, which means you can also take more current. Okay, and then um, this is the transversity experiment, um, which is what I have been talking about. And you see we reach 60%. And we also occasionally got 65% at 15 uh, micron. And um, so now, um, so here we use transversity to represent this experiment, okay, E06010. And, and this is the um, 12 GB, uh, one of the first um, 12 GB experiment, the first polarized helium 3 12 GB experiment uh, at Jefferson Lab uh, in Hall C. And um, so the experiment ran in the fall of 2019. And after that, of course, you know what happened with COVID. So you can see the improvement of figure Mary, right? And um, it's more than doubled. Okay, um, so what kind of results um, I can um, show here? And one is trans transversity or, or, or Collins um, asymmetry or Collins amplitude. Um, this is directly on the neutron. Okay, we use helium three, but I also we also need to be I should need to be a little bit careful. We do need to correct for helium three nuclear effect, namely to remove you know whatever effect from the proton. You need to do that. So after you have done the nuclear correction, and this is the uh, result on on the uh, neutron, and um, you know. The, this kind of experiment is difficult, and the, um, the apparatus, as I mentioned to you, was never designed for this kind of CDS measurement and looking for azimuth angular dependence. So that um, you know, we are only able to show you, you know, everything we integrate over other kinematic coverage acceptance, right? Just show you as a function of x, and, and you can see that our error bar is still rather, uh, quite large, and um, you know, so this is the um, this is the columns, and then um, and, and and what do we have? So here, pi plus and pi minus. Okay, and this is what we have. Uh, so what we have seen. 
Okay, and um, so here is sievers. And the sievers, um, again, uh, with all the caveats I just mentioned, even though this is you know, still already a great success, and we see maybe some kind of asymmetry or uh, non-zero amplitude in the pi plus case, but in the pi, mi uh, pi minus case, looks like perhaps it's consistent with zero. And, and, and here are different um, theoretical uh, model of uh, global fit of a phenomenology fit um, one can compare with. Okay, and um, you know, if you look at these, I would say, you know, our result, even though error bars are large, but seem to be consistent. And, and here, of course, <laughs> our error bars are so much larger. And I don't know, you know, it's important to really improve this kind of experiment to see whether, you know, here it looks like it is quite substantially non-zero, but of course the error box is large. And we also look at the personality, as I mentioned to you, this is a quantity which is kind of interesting because it involves um, the kind of interference of two quark state with angular momentum difference of two. So you can have, um, you know, um, I guess you can have PP and you can also have SD interference. Um, and, and here shows our results. And I just noticed one thing, okay, what did I notice? I noticed our personality result looks a little bit similar to our transversity result, which I should not be too surprised, I guess. Um, so here shows, uh, and also we give you um, two uh, park model uh, predictions. And unfortunately, you know, the two models tell you something very similar. And, and our data just do not have the kind of um, um, precision to tell, okay? Okay, so, um, so with, with Hermes and with Compass and also with um, our JLAP result as well as E plus E minus from Bell, I think at that time just Bell, later Baba also has result and then later um, Bass also has result. And um, a, a number group, especially the uh, Javier, right? Is that Javier? No, this is not a uh, Torino group. And they carry out global fit. And um, so they have to do Q square evolution so that because different experiment um, was done at a different, even though they are, for example, Hermes and the uh, GLAB experiment, the Q square similar, but not the same. And Compass. Uh, data um, uh, at a uh, much higher uh, Q square. So that you have to, you know, making sure you apply Q square evolution, then you look at everything at the same Q squared. So the scale, um, this global analysis uh, uses 2.4 GV. And, and that basically tells you the kind of centroid as well as, you know, the overall uncertainty uh, one, one has. And, and as I mentioned, because E plus E minus data um, was included, which will determine uh, the Collins uh, fermentation uh, function. Um, and, and, and actually they also um, include a KM of data from um, Hermes. And I think Compass uh, also has KM data. Okay, so that's the global uh, fit on TND. And, and I have been talking about these three. Um, just to give you an example. But if you are interested, you can look at the, um, I have this website here somewhere uh, where I mentioned about the workshop at Jefferson Lab last May. And there are a number of uh, two very good talks um, on Humphers and uh, Hermes, and where they also give you, uh, show you results uh, looking at the other uh, TNDs. Okay, um, so now I want to uh, talk about 12 GV. Um, and let me just ask, are there any questions? Questions in the room? There's a question here, Andrew. I was curious. So if we calculate things like a lepton scattering off of a proton and experimentally you're doing that sort of, but it's using say NH3, how difficult is it to uh, compare answers at the end, subtract out, I guess, the background? 
Yeah, you, you also need very good question. I mean, you know, you also need to um, do measurement and, and people have done, you know, on polarized uh, CBS measurement, Hermes has done, you know, from different nuclear targets. So absolutely, you need, you know, the ideal case, you also measure CDs at the same kinematics from nitrogen, right? And then you subtract. And if you don't have that, and then you have to rely on on polarized CDs measurement from from proton and the neutron, and then you know you have to um, um, basically uh, try to um, take care. You know, try to again, as I said, ideally you measure, and people do measure that, and then you can help you to determine your dilution factor and to correct for that. I could Thanks just hear that. Oh, sorry. Repeat the question. Uh, who does the burden of correcting for that fall onto usually? The, the oh, oh, experimentalist. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We we do all the hard work. I'm joking. Uh -huh. so Sarah's just white papers and then talking about our results compared with their theory or model or phenomenology. If I meant to be joking. Um, but experimentalists, you you know, we have to do that, right? Because this is a very important part of experimental detail. And I didn't tell you. Um, I mean, there are a lot of details, and um, I have a graduate student um, recently. You know, the student feel like okay, working in the lab is like, and, and unfortunately, experimental science sometimes it is a bit like that. And I didn't tell you, you know, helium three, right? I said, oh, helium three is great. You know, it's highly polarized on neutron, but actually, for um, for um, speed exchange optical pumping, in order to have a, a high polarization, we also introduce. I mean, I mentioned we have, have an alkali atom in order to do optical pumping and then dipole dipole to transfer polarization from electronic polarization to, new, to the proton. But alkali is such a small quantity, I don't need to worry about it, okay? It's just orders of magnitude, you know. But we have to introduce some nitrogen in order to quench, you know, uh, the system to reach, uh, otherwise you will have a depolarization from radiative uh, decay. But when we introduce nitrogen to the system, that's our background. So we also, during our experiment, in addition to a high pressure polarized helium 3 cell, which have certain quantity, uh, amount of nitrogen, we have to make a nitrogen reference cell with identical geometry and the same kind of same window and fill with nitrogen. And just like the target, then you do measurement from the so-called nitrogen cell, then in the end, you remove the background. Thank you. I, okay. Okay. I can wait till later. Oh, my other question just had to do with the figure of Mary. Oh, you show, yeah. Is the purpose of that just to show that the uh, that over the years you've gotten better at polarizing the target because that additional yeah, 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 absolutely. You are absolutely correct. So um you know, for a long time, what people do for, let me just use one technology, which is a high uh, spin change optical pumping, because that allow you to make high pressure cell. So for a long, long time, we use potassium to do optical pumping. And then we also use rubidium, okay? And uh, later, actually, interestingly, um, some of the uh, very smart people, they actually realize that if I mix potassium and rubidium, okay, and I, I still, Polarize, uh, I think we polarize rubidium, but I introduced some potassium. Um, I Sorry, I got myself confused. I mentioned, yeah, we people did try, typically we use rubidium, but people also try with potassium. But what is actually very effective is you have both and you polarize rubidium, but then rubidium and potassium will have spin exchange collision. And then you have a spin exchange collision with, uh, with the uh, proton. So this kind of two-step process in the end actually allow you to, uh, um, you know, Im improve or increase your polarization. But laser, laser technology is also getting a lot better. And then uh, you have a narrow uh, band laser so that the laser uh, bandwidth uh, have a much better overlap with the Doppler profile of the uh, um, uh, atomic species, which is uh, rubidium or potassium. Otherwise, you know, you can have a broadband laser, but you are only using a very narrow part of the uh, uh, bandwidth for your optical pumping because the overlap is not very good. But once you can squeeze the laser, the laser uh, align with um, matches better with the profile of the atom, then you actually 
the atoms is very effectively being polarized, or you should say, I should say, you are using the laser very efficiently, effectively. So there, there are technologies, um, um, but you're absolutely right. Mostly is the polarization increasing, but also we are getting better so that we can make the target and the target can take more electron beam current. So, so remember it's a polarization square, right? And then times the beam current. That's the figure of merit. That's why you don't normalize it to the same beam current because because that info is also useful to you? Oh yeah, because um, that tells me, you know, when I do scattering experiments, right, I want to, you know, I want to make, you know, oh, the other thing is you also want to increase the target pressure. If you can make the target even more dense or the number density, you know, of the target is larger, that also helps you, right? Because scattering is a problem, you know, it's a scattering is a probability in the cross section, you want to, increase your target sickness, you want to increase your intensity of the beam, right? So that will give you more events. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I don't see any other questions. Okay, so very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time and I always uh, over prepare and that uh, make myself very stressed out. And um, I have been teaching for so long, but when I, um, initially started to teach, I always had the dreams, um, which is that I, I was underprepared, means that in the middle of the class, I ran out of things to talk about, right? So I always had this dream when I first started to teach. So my habit is I always overprepare, but the good thing is you guys have my slides, so you can look at your leisure. Um, 12 GB upgrade, um, as I mentioned, completed uh, beautifully, so um, I will just skip. And yeah, so um, so here show you, um, so before the 12 GB upgrade, so there were only three experimental called A, B, and C. And on the transverse experiment with polarized helium 3, we did that in hall A. Okay, so um, 12 GB, in addition to energy upgrade, also added a new experimental hall called hall D. And hall D um, has a new uh, spectrometer um, uh, called Gu X uh, spectrometer. And the, um, you know, Group X was built to look for exotic uh, meson and also, you know, group or things like that. And Hall B um, in the 6GB era ha had a 6GB uh, class uh, spectrometer and then um, a new one, 12GB. For 12GB is called class 12 now. And um, in Hall A, as I mentioned, just the original two spectrometer, but uh, more recently, um, the super big by remember, the transversal experiment, we use a big by, but there is a super big by, and spectrometer was built, um, supported by DOE, and um, just started data taking with big by, super big by, uh, I think, um, I want to say last fall. Okay, and in Hall C, um, there is a high momentum spectrometer, and then for 12 GV, it built another super high uh, momentum spectrometer, and so that's Hall C. And Hall B has an extensive program to look at the three-dimensional uh, tomography of the nucleon and both transverse momentum TND and also GPD. And Hall C also has a program related to CVIS, but um, so far I think all for unpolarized one, and I will say why it is also important. And then Hall A, I will tell you a little bit about the experiment or the program we proposed which is solid uh, using both polarized helium-3 and also polarized ammonia target. But um, design and experiment, which has a two pi acceptance and also can handle high luminosity. Oh, so, so this is how the detector look like, the uh, spectrometers look like after they are built. And um, so this one show you our uh, class 12. Uh, this is very, very new results, uh, beams in asymmetry. So um, this is a longitudinally polarized beam and unpolarized target proton, and they do uh, single spin asymmetry measurement. And you can also get information. Um, and in this case, it's actually, I think what they are looking for is, um, I'm a little bit confused what they were looking for. Yeah, so they were looking for this, um, um, LU, which is unpolarized target, longitudinally polarized beam. 
And they look at this asymmetry in nine different beans. So what they have is BL bean and Q squared. They divide that into nine beans. Then they look as a function of PT, okay? And then as a function of Z. So, so um, remember there are four kinematic quantities. So here I show you Z and the PT, but then they combine the other two dimensions as these nine beans. Okay, and if you combine everything all together, I think that is the black uh, dots compared with their um, the 6GV results um, from um, you know, 6GV error. Uh, I will skip this um, because of time, and um, I will skip this also, and let me just, I don't know why I have this. I, I will just mention, um, say a few words about Hall C. So remember I mentioned about the very complicated DIS formalism early on, right? And I also said, okay, this is based on factorization assumption, you know, and in Hall C, with high momentum spectrometer and super high momentum spectrometer. So what they can do is to look at the cross-section, they measure the cross-section, then they do so-called longitudinal and transverse separation. So what, that, what does that mean? Remember, uh, electron scattering, um, the dominant um, contribution is the virtual photon exchange, right? one photon change. When the photon is virtual, you know, you have, you can have a longitudinal and transverse polarization. Then you can look at the response um, or you can look at the, the structure uh, based on the virtual photon longitudinal polarization and transverse polarization, you can separate the two and so-called LT separation. And that really uh, is a very sensitive, a good way to, for you to test on the factor, factorization approach, for example. So it is important to understand, you know, whether the kind of formalism um, developed by uh, theoreticians really are applicable to the Jefferson lab uh, kinematics, because people sometimes say, okay, 12 GV is still perhaps too low for DIS kinematics. So this really is very um, helpful. And I mentioned about a super big byte. And so there is a, a program or experiment uh, planned and super big by now already has been installed in hall A and uh, a polarized helium three target um, has been built. And so I think this is from will take data. So, and so here just show their projection, okay, for the super big by uh, measurement. Let me say a few words about, um, so in the next 16 minutes, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be extremely ambitious. I will tell you about solid, then I'll also tell you a little bit about EXP. We will see how we do. Okay, so solid, um, we say, we claim solid, that's QCB at the intensity frontier, um, because we are able to uh, handle the designed apparatus will handle 10 to the 37 to 39 uh, per centimeter square per second, okay? And large acceptance, phi will be too high. And this actually has a very comprehensive, rich program, not just TMD or CDS TMD, but also um, can do a very precise measurement of JSI production from the proton near the uh, threshold. And the physics is that um, in order to try to understand, you know, or to help us to access so-called anomalous quantum uh, energy piece, that contribution to the proton mass. And also has a parity violating deep in elastic scattering experiment. This is actually very cool, right? So in this case, um, we do inclusive DIS measurement, but the electron beam is polarized and the target is not polarized. And we look for inclusive um, um, parity violating uh, DIS uh, measurement. And that actually, um, you know, provide a well test uh, standard model and looking for new physics. But I'm going to tell you about uh, CDIS. So with this kind of apparatus and uh, high luminosity, large acceptance, um, two pi acceptance. And here I just show you um, these points, I think I showed you early, um, but in a different form. When I show you the 6GV um, or A, helium 3, Experiment. So then you come right from 
demonstrate our data points. And then for the 6G experiment, we just have four points. So that just set the scales. Complete for we have a point of five, and here show yes, and then virtual you additional uh, baby. From as both um, polarized helium three experiment approved, and also um, uh, NH three target, which will be you know as we talk about as a neutron, uh, sorry as a proton target. So we can do um, LT, uh, sorry we can do U and D separation. So just give you the kind of um, uh, idea or impression how much better we will be able to do, and the narrow the, the wider band uh, shows the. Uh, um, um, by the way, red shows U park and blue shows D park. So that's the first thing. And then the uh, uh, wider band shows what we currently know um, from global analysis, including all the data. And then you just add the projected solid data. And then it's the dark or the narrow band. So that tells you how much better we will be able to do um, in the U park case and also D park case for transversity and also for sievers. And, and the lower figure just tell you if you think about how much better you in narrow bar, and then you know we can improve. For example, you know ten to even more than fifteen. And here is in the D case, but in our case we can do you know a factor of thirty or thirty reduction of the overall experimental uncertainty. Okay, so tensor charge, a few words about tensor charge, which is um, extremely interesting um, in the sense that, um, you know, this quantity, if you think about that, um, you know, it's just like we, we talk about charge, right? We, you know, proton charge. And this is, in some way, you can think about that, you know, just perhaps just as important as proton charge, right? It, fundamentally speaking from QCD, you know, right? It's, um, and it's defined um, by this uh, matrix element. And um, a tensor charge is determined, as I mentioned, by the uh, transversity uh, integral. And um, neutral uh, uh, proton and neutron electric dipole moment. And this is something very important um, because of CP violation. And we know that um, because of the uh, baryon number asymmetry of the U networks, whatever we know about CP, right, um, in standard model is not able to explain why we see everything is matter, right? Instead of matter and high matter. And um, okay, so where to look for new physics, right? Certainly now, neutrino sector looks very promising in terms of discovering uh, additional uh, type of CP violation mechanism beyond standard model. But EDM, neutron and proton EDM is another place. So in this case, if you think about, let's just assume that, okay, so where do I get neutron EDM? Okay, if they, uh, you know, due to the quark EDM, for example. And then the coefficient in front is actually just the corresponding tensor charge. So, so that's why our TMD or transversity is interesting in the sense now I can connect that to uh, neutron uh, to nu nuclear EDM, which will also provide, in addition to test um, uh, tensor charge compared with lattice QZ prediction, for example, here. Um, this shows the 12 GV uh, solid uh, tensor charge um, projection for U quark, a U quark and D quark, uh, compared with uh, different kind of global fit result currently we have, as well as um, lattice uh, QCD uh, prediction. And I think this one perhaps is not even the most recent one. And later I have a more recent one uh, to show you. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time, and this one just show you uh, in the case of sievers, how much better we will be able to do. And um, very interesting is quantity, uh, a study is that you can, okay, you can, of course it's model dependent, but what is important is to see the kind of impact, even though it's a model dependent impact, but you can still see, right? So in this particular analysis, and one can use uh, sievers uh, result to determine what's the average um, uh, a weighted average, uh, you know, U quark or D quark transverse momentum inside a proton and, and neutron, for example, right? 
And, and then you see, okay, if I do a uh, 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 um, solid measurement, how much better I will be able to, you see the arrow bar here, and then you see the arrow bar, right? The improvement is amazing, right? So that's why I said it's model dependent, but you know, the impact is model independent. And similarly, you can see in the case of crystallosity, how much better we will be able to do. And again, in a model dependent way, you can use that to, uh, to determine what is the orbital angular momentum of the U quark and D quark. And again, you can see the impact uh, from the solid. And, and this one just um, to show how you know, we compare with the compass measurement, as I mentioned to you earlier. Um, we, I, I show you the compass, they use the deuteron and we use helium three. Okay, um, uh, I probably don't have time, but I want to say a few words about the IC. And but maybe I take um, 10 seconds. So currently we are running a uh, RIC round 22 with translucently polarized proton, uh, proton uh, collision. And um, and so there's a, a, the physics program is TMB physics, okay? And what is really nice here is that essentially you can think about, you know, like um, a kind of, you know, P, P, right? You can think about your U quark and the D quark and U and U bar, right? And so you can look at charge current um, effect or process as well as neutral current process. And, and, and then, uh, you know, what is nice is that you look for this kind of Sievers effect, then you can test the universality of Sievers effect. Um, and here I show you one example columns. Okay, EIC, seven minutes. Okay, so EIC, wonderful. Um, it, it has been in the making for a long time and, it, you know, it will take another a good number of years um, when we can start our data taking, but very, very good progress um, has been making or has been, uh, are being made. And the important question we want to answer is, you know, how does the proton mass arise and spin? And also, you know, what are the emergent property of dense system or gluons? EIC kinematics is really the C quark and gluon uh, region, which is the uh, so-called small x and high q square region. Um, in the interest of time, and I just want to show you, um, right, so BNL and JLAB are two uh, partners or two main partners. So we have other partners for EIC and um, the two labs issued a call for proposal last March and we received three proposals. And um, we uh, um, had a public meeting uh, in December and just today, a few hours actually before um, um, this lecture, um, the second um, EIC um, detector proposal advisory panel meeting just concluded. And the second meeting uh, mostly was on the panel to review the responses uh, from the three collaboration to the questions of the panel uh, uh, asked. Um, at the end of the uh, um, of the written question the panel provided to the collaboration uh, last December. And very quickly um, to show you the kind of uh, precision or improvement, if this is the current information, right? This is the uh, um, um, quark spin contribution to the proton spin, and this is the gluon spin contribution to the proton spin. And you can see the yellow uh, ellipse, ellipse and that's corresponding to, you know, um, the kind of EIC measurement uh, one can achieve with a different uh, combination of uh, beam, uh, beam energy and also higher uh, energy uh, combination for the um, collision. And um, uh, TND and the GPD is a very important part of the um, EIC program. And, um, just to show you the kind of kinematics. Um, um, yeah, this slide, I, 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 should, I should have removed something, I didn't. But I think the, the, the important information is the kind of kinematic um, you know, complementarity and also the reach of the EIC, right? So this is, um, you know, for X is less than 10 to minus four, for example. 
yeah, I, I, I should have removed this slide, so I have to do that. This one probably is not the best one for this purpose. It's a little bit out of the order. I forgot to remove it. And here just show you um, the GUA uh, GPEs um, uh, EIC uh, will be able to uh, accomplish. Um, I'm almost there. So um, let me just say, um, yeah, I, I think I, my slides, it's okay. So here just show you, remember we talk about the uh, tensor charge. And um, so here just show you, currently the knowledge is this pink area. And then with EIC, uh, both in the case of EIC, both EP collision and E helium 3 ion collision, and both, you know, the beam is polarized, but the electron in this case, single beam symmetry, so the electron does not need to be polarized. And with EIC, you see um, it is this um, blue uh, uh, ellipse here. And then if we do solid, and that's the green one, if we combine solid and EIC, that's the uh, um, yellow. Or orange one. So, so that um, really tells you that it's important to do uh, this kind of both measurement. And, and I mentioned TMD, uh, tensor charge, which allow you to really compare with lattice prediction and also connects to the beyond standard model physics. And one example is uh, neutron or BBM. And in the interest of time, and I just want to very, very quickly to tell you what does this mean. And, and this, is, this means that if, just think about if, you know, if neutron EDM, oh, by the way, if neutron EDM is non-zero, and that is a direct evidence for time reversal symmetry violation. And so far, we don't have any evidence of, for CPT violation. So therefore, when I see, you know, in the EDM case, a direct evidence for time reversal symmetry violation, and we, we think that will, you know, hopefully will tell us a new mechanism for CP violation. So that's why EDM is so important. So this picture just, again, says that if EDM is due to the quark contribution and then the coefficients are the tensor charge, then I want to combine EDM search and tensor charge together, right? To see what kind of constraint I can put on the quark EDM. And um, the most interesting thing is that if I only improve tensor charge but not improve EDM, I'm not going to, I, I will improve a little bit, but not too much. But if I improve both, if I combine, for example, um, by the way, this one is based on solid, not even including EIC. If we include EIC, it will be much better. It, it will be better. Um, so here show you that if I, um, if I you know, include the tensor charge for UND, and I also improve, um, include the next generation of EDN measurement, and for example, in the neutron case, you know, the goal is all the is three times 10 to minus 28 E times the E is the charge of the electron times the centimeter. And, and that shows you the, the black one. Okay. And the currently we are the blue one. So that tells you the kind of sensitivity to uh, new physics. And um, and we have done, you know, we we actually look at you know what does this mean, right? And what kind of new field we're talking about. And in the study we did, and in this particular model, and we actually even have sensitivity to new physics at the level of 30 to 40 TeV. And again, that was just the um, solid prediction or projection if we include EIC and certainly will be even more uh, sensitive to new physics. Okay, I think I will just end here and 7.30 magically. Thank you very much, Diane. For uh, one or two questions from the room, if there are any. Raise your hand on Zoom if you have a question. Leonard, your name appeared in this talk. You should have a question. Uh, well, I have a question. I, I, I okay. Heard, uh, Leonard's uh, statement that both solid and EIC have a big impact on the tensor charge. And both, I agree that both experiments uh, need to be done, particularly solid. 
I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't really. Um, Letter it's hiding in the back, but he concurred I, with. I, uh, I am supporting your, uh, <laughs> your statement about that the need for solid to be uh, to go forward so that we can get uh, greater constraints on that tensor charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that uh, this goes unnoticed sometimes. And I, I fully support this point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, I do have a question um, on your slide about the EDM. The next one. Uh, maybe the next one. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you explain the equation uh, that the neutron EDM is dependent on the tensor charge? That's, uh, I was, I should know this, but I don't. <laughs> Yeah, so, so. but basically, I mean, if you write down the um, if you okay, so I, <laughs> I I think that if you look at our paper, I mean, it, not just our paper, it, you can look at the paper and um, right. just have the matrix elements, and you actually uh, essentially have the same matrix element in front, which is, is just it, is, it, um, is is it a derivation or is it a constraint? Oh, it, it, it is just um, how you write down the uh, the EDM. Um, in, terms so of, in terms of EDMs or the quarks times the tensor charges, that's, yeah. I should know this, I don't know it. <laughs> Sorry, this is very interesting to me. It's got to be a CP violating. Yeah, yeah, point yeah. That couples to the photon. Right, right. Anyway, very interesting. So, so there are a number of paper related to this. Um, there are Wen Li and all they have down the study on the lattice, I believe. And then yeah, there's okay. Marcos, Marcos um, Radici, and they look at beta decay, and Simonetta Luti at all also look at beta decay, and we look at EDM. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very interesting though. Okay, thanks. If I can elaborate on that, uh, I guess I didn't appreciate before this connection that, yeah, EIS, some like DIS experiment. Um, probes, you know, the same thing as the uh, EDM experiment. Yeah. Um, does, uh, if EIC, if EIC um, makes a measurement that um, measures the tensor, quark tensor charges very precisely, does that help the EDM experiments reduce any of their uncertainties in trying to find the non-zero EDM? Well, it is not, it is not, um, you know, Measuring um, tensor charge precisely is not going to help you measure neutral proton EDM precisely. What I'm saying is that actually because they are related, so you can actually combine the two of them to put constraint on, or you can put constraint on new physics mm -hmm. in a model dependent way, right? You know, when you talk about new physics, what new physics are you talking about, right? You have to, you know, Come up with some model, and um, oh. I, I hope I made this clear. So you know, EDM experiment, you do EDM experiment, very very difficult. But people are working on that, right? So that's a completely different experiment. Uh, for many years, I was um, I'm still technically, but I have not been able to do anything on the neutron EDM experiment at uh, SMS at Oak Ridge. And um, so that's a very different experiment, okay? And then you do um, electron scattering on some inclusive DIS measurement, like what people have done at Hermes and Compass and JLAP and DIC future. And, and you measure transversely TND, you try to get transversity, and then you try to get integral, get a tensile charge. So that's the quantity you are trying to measure, right? So what I find is very interesting, of course, is all fundamentally speaking in the end, it is related to the nuclear structure to QCD, right? Because when you when you write down um, the uh, um, the the EDM in terms of EDM is due to the uh, quark, right? You know, UD and strange quark. You know, essentially these quantities are depend on the on the, the QCD, right? Depend on the nuclear structure. But what I find is very interesting is actually, you know, it's a QCD, which is strong interaction, but then it connects to CP violation in this very interesting way, right? Through the um, through the tensor charts through EDM, with EDM. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But Los Alamos, of course, I'm very interested in any arguments that justify both neutron EDF and EIC physics, especially. Right, right, right. Of course. Um, Thank you for the uh, ideas that I can write in the uh, research proposal. So, anyway.
Any uh, did you have a question? Right. Yeah, go ahead. There's one more question here. Well, I have a question about um, transversity. You define the transversity through a uh, Dirac structure, I sigma mu nu. Is there a specific uh, Dirac structure or for any, any mu nu works for that? Because I see some people, they work it like I plus, they uh, use I sigma I plus, but I don't know why like this specific uh, Dirac structure we use for transversity. transversity. I think the slide you uh, define the transversity. Well, that's just a definition. Where where do I have it? Is that here on this one? Maybe. I believe it's. In... Is that this one here? Yes. Is that the I sigma mu nu? Is that Dirac structure, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, is there any specific Dirac structure or it works for an. Yeah. Yeah, the tensor charge is, is uh, defined with sigma mu nu gamma phi. Is that what you're asking? Well, I'm asking. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's a complicator of. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but I mean, why the specific one is I sigma I plus? That's just defined this way. I mean, you, you, you can, from an operator definition, you can define the tensor charge the interval over the transversity uh, distribution. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that box is, uh, yeah. Also related to a uh, unintegrated, uh, you know, uh, port correlator. You can, you can relate that directly. Is, is that what you're asking? Oh, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, in the same way, you know, you define F1, G1, you can define H1, which is the transversity. And then if you take the zeroth moment of transversity, which is what I am has here. Uh, so GT is the difference between the up and the down, I think. Uh, but um, those those are those are zero moments of the transversity distribution. Zero zero KT moments is what I'm looking for. Sorry, zero KT and grab Leonard and yeah. get him to explain it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, let's. Yeah, I think maybe we should uh, close the session because we have a whole evening session tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Hayan very much for these lectures. Okay, bye-bye. I completely concur that you guys do much harder work than we do. So. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. All right, I'll end the Zoom meeting here.